I have a cheerful message and smiles will be permitted and even encouraged. I'm writing a book on joy, said a rabbi to a colleague of mine in New York. That book found that the root of the word joy in the Old Testament is chemda, which when it is conjoined with the phrase of the Lord, means three things. It means gladness, it means togetherness, or being joined one with another, and it means something about the temple. Nehemiah was the rebuilder of the temple. The phrase joy of the Lord attends his invitation to the newly rebuilt temple. Now, our sacred texts place joy in the same mode, and our history writes it in flesh and blood. Brigham Young, this is his institution, but he said this about the terrible persecutions and drivings of our people. He said, you who have read about this and did not go through it may say to yourselves, I could never have endured that. Then he responds, I was in the heat of it, and I never felt better in my life. I never felt the peace and power of the Almighty more copiously poured out upon me than in the keenest part of our trials. They appeared nothing to me. He has a witness, Heber C. Kimball, who said, when I have been in the presence of Brother Brigham, we would feel such a buoyant spirit that when we began to talk, we couldn't express our feelings. So Brigham would say, Hallelujah. And I would say, Glory to God. I feel it and I say it. A second witness is Eliza R. Snow, who said, The saints are the only people who know how to be happy under all circumstances. My great-grandfather, Jedediah M. Grant, once wrote that it had taken him a long time, even when he was at the graveside of a baby girl buried on the plains, he said he felt near unto heaven. He said, I have learned not to fret myself. I thank the Lord for the bitter as well as the sweet. I want the saints to live in a way that they can feel happy all the time, and then we shall enjoy the Holy Spirit. Now, we all as a commonplace know that the Spirit brings joy. The revelation to me is that joy brings the Spirit. When we are happy, the Spirit flows more freely, otherwise not. Looking back, our presidents and my studies also show me their wives have said together in different ways that because of the gospel and the joy of the Lord, the sufferings of the wicked are far more than the sufferings of the righteous. And the Plains epic is their metaphor for our lives. Remember, adventurers and fortune seekers left civilization and left acting civilized to race west to the mines, every man for himself. The saints became a community on wheels. They were linked in common cause and they went in the name of the Lord. The desperados, the explorers, went to the obsession to be first and to strike it rich and to jump claims, even gun down their opponents. The Mormon battalion left the gold fields without gold to return to their wives and families and to create a no culture and a new civilization in the vision 
of Zion. The saints sometimes died in each other's arms with a prayer that cannot be said of some of those in the Donner Party. They had covenanted to pool their resources so every person, able-bodied or not, could make this rite of passage. Their temple was burned behind them. Their anticipated temple was a thousand miles and forty years away. But the beginning and the end of their journey was Christ. Now, what of today? Perhaps we can credit the computer for our increasing impatience. By the way, I don't know how to get the demons out of my computer. Uh, this generation is intent on what they want and how they want it and when. Don't wait for next week. Forget others. Forget other uh, nonsense about rules. Play the game your way. Cut corners. Make your own rules. We may be in the midst of the most impatient generation in history. But the truth is, all supernal joys take time and discipline and discipleship. We're taught that the opposite of humility is arrogance, and our prophet has recently alerted us against that. I suggest that the opposite of meekness is demandingness. I demand mine. Some of us are apparently willing to do anything wrong in order to get our rights. But the teaching of Jesus turns that upside down. The meek will inherit the earth precisely because they understand the kind of caring that leads to sharing. And they demand, like the Christ, nothing. They pray, as he prayed, for deliverance and relief. But their blessings flow unto them without compulsory means because they submit to a higher and wiser will. In the academy just now, one of the per words is postmodernism. As superficialized, this is the notion that anything goes, that no one can say what is true or false, or what is good or bad. But this stance is not really post, and it's not uh, Modern. It was old when Socrates was young. It's the notion which I submit is willful ignorance of human history that a self-centered life is just as good as any other life. But that's the attitude I suggest of sick souls. And when it enters our presence, it becomes a fourteenth article of faith, which negates the other thirteen. Quote, we believe in narcissism. Modern scripture has a definition of this. It's called seeking to be a law unto yourself. For such, there is a guaranteed result. It's Dostoevsky who wrote that if God is dead, then everything is allowed. Well, both his premise and his conclusion are misleading. You see, neither God nor law tell you what you must do. That's a fiction. They tell you what the inevitable consequences will be of what you do do. So here is an absolute that is not obsolete. It is more reliable than the second law of thermodynamics. Put negatively, if you 
seek your own immediate gratification, ignoring, neglecting, or worse, exploiting others, you will not find joy. You will find a shimmera. And if you persist, you will find misery. You cannot find joy that way any more than you can jump off your own shadow. As a little boy, I used to try to see the refrigerator door turn the light off. Did you ever try that? I hurt my nose badly. You can't see the light turn off because precisely the door is closed before the life. The light goes on or off. Let's put it positively, as Jesus did. If you lose yourself for my sake and the gospel's, you will rejoice and be exceeding glad. You will experience the joy of the Lord. So it is not chance, it is choice that is involved here. Each of us has some control on finding joy. In the words of Elder Marion D. Hanks, in this world, pain is inevitable. Misery is optional. Think about it. Christ is against selfishness and sin not because he is the giant spoil sport, just the other way around. He is against sin and selfishness because he is against despondency and melancholy and morbidity and against the shrinking of our capacity for fulfillment. On this, he is the world's leading expert. He knows. As the book of Hebrews has it, he, for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross. Whose joy did he envision? Ours. He saw beyond our sins and stupidities and our clumsy mistakes. He knew what we have it in us to become. And having paid the awful price in blood, he is entitled to alert us to reality. This changes the kinds of questions we ask of life. Instead of What's in it for me? What's in it for those I love or should love? Instead of, why am I having such a hard time? Am I growing through my hard times? Can I see any meaning or purpose for the good of the kingdom in my struggle? Instead of, how soon? Can I get what I want? Can I train my desires to be a better friend of Christ? All these questions become prayers, ending, and however long it takes, O oh Lord, stay with me. For the Latter-day Saints, the plight is worse or better. We were not only born with the light of Christ, but we have been exposed to an environment of light. We have been exposed to the roots and the fruits of the tree of life. So the result is in Heber C. Kimball's ungrammatical sentence after the saints had made covenant in the Nauvoo temple. He said, quote, you can't sin so cheap no more. Mm. In our heart, we all know the difference. We know the difference between his way and all other ways. Whatever takes off our relish for spiritual things, whatever we cannot consistently invite the Spirit to attend, not for us. Sin and selfishness are furtive, they're half-hearted, and they're self-dividing. But Christ's way is wholehearted, and the wholeness becomes holiness. Sin cannot sing. The music of sin is a dirge. It is a wilderness 
crying in a voice. But Christ's way is song, new song, a lifting song. Sin loves darkness and covers up. It is darkening, but Christ's way is light, and light cleaves to light. Sin and the defiant defense of sin is ugly. Christ's way is beautiful and everlastingly so. There is no joy in iniquity, and contrary to the world, there is no joy in unequity. We are promised that one day, should we be faithful, we will be equal in heavenly things and even ultimately in earthly things. Now let me try to name three dimensions of joy, all of which I think require the Spirit and a revelatory awareness. Number one, the joy of mission. These are what I call right-track feelings, the sense that no matter where we are or what we're doing, we're on the Lord's errand, that we're serving Him even in trifles. The conviction is that where you are is the best place for you to be as long as you need to be there. This applies even to sick beds and dentist chairs. It even applies to prison. Such a sermon was delivered in the state penitentiary. Afterward, a young man from here forgot himself and prayed, Bless all those who aren't here this time that they may be here next time. <laughs> and that's going a little too far. In the Church, our per word is active, and it is, of course, crucial. But even if we are partially disabled, and we are, most of us, in ways, even then, if the heart is continually filled with righteous desires, they are transforming. The activity Christ most cares about is within us, amidst the bustle. In short, wherever we are can be a pleasant place if Christ approves us there and attends us there. It is said that a man in Jerusalem was in bad need of a job and applied and was given a job of going daily to a flat roof and looking toward the east to anticipate the Messiah. He was asked about his job and said, "Well." The pay isn't much, but the work is steady. Well, we all have that steady job. It was assigned us by the Master, assigned the saints when they were driven out in midwinter of Missouri. The counsel was, seek the face of the Lord always, that in patience you may possess your souls. Again, at winter quarters, history repeating itself, the Lord said, If thou art sorrowful, call on the Lord thy God with supplication that you may become joyful. And when he said, In the world ye shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. His disciples had almost nothing to cheer about except their relationship with Him and the transcending anticipation of His return. Number two, the joy or joys of the senses. It was H. L. Mencken who scored religious people as those who, quote, live in mortal dread that somewhere, sometime, somebody is enjoying himself. It's a sharp indictment. It's one of the superstitions of the irreligious, I suggest, that religious people can't have fun. We work at it in this Church. Well, such religion is not the Mencken's religion, not the religion 
of the glad tidings of the Master. Notice his promised reward for keeping the Sabbath. And he only imposed one condition. He said we, we should keep the Sabbath with a glad heart and a cheerful countenance. And then his promise, quote, the good things of the earth, and it shall bring forth in its strength. Listen, for food and for raiment, for taste and for smell, to please the eye and to gladden the heart, to strengthen the body and enliven the soul. And he defines this as the fullness of the earth. He even defines fasting and prayer, fasting ordinarily conjoined with mourning, with rejoicing and prayer. Some of my children didn't appreciate that in their earlier years. Further, the Master did not say we would only be happy when we transcend the earth. He said instead that this very earth transformed will become heaven. He said that even here we may begin to enjoy that which shall be in full hereafter. At this level, joy and pleasure are not opposed. They are combined. Jesus did not say through John in his epistle, love not the world. He said, love not the wickedness of the world. He did not say keep yourselves unspotted from the world, but from the sins of the world. He did not say the body is intrinsically evil. He said this body, yes, easily perverted and abused. But this body is a temple which is a house of light and glory. It can be a Stradivarius violin on which, if we permit him, he can, as master musician, play. I was struck this morning again by a line from Joseph Smith, man is himself an instrument of music. Through his modern prophet, the Lord has promised that the Spirit would not only illumine our minds, but heighten all our senses. Sight, sound, smell, taste, touch. What else is a glorious resurrection? Now, the devil's game is to convince you that he is the king of enjoyment. He advertises shortcuts to ecstasy. Buy into my game, he says, and the rewards are all here in glittering neon. But as usual, he lies. He lies big time. In wrath over his own permanent unembodiment, he either taunts us that the body is nothing, and we seek then a kind of negative spirituality. Or, he tells us the opposite, the body's everything. And you know where that leads. Himself in abject misery of his own making, he seeks to make all men miserable like himself. He is a double-crosser. He keeps no promises. He not only doesn't deliver, he enslaves. He is the saddest of saddists in the universe. The Savior, in contrast, will never ever tamper with your freedom except if you will cooperate with him to increase it. Seventy-five times I count in the Doctrine and Covenants where he pleads with us, ask, seek, but he will not force. He has everything to give that the devil claims to have, and he has never broken a promise yet. Number three, the joys of contemplation and anticipation. Jesus said in modern revelation, If thou shalt ask, thou shalt receive revelation upon revelation, knowledge upon knowledge. Is there Joy in learning, however difficult? Yes. All learning can be 
fulfilling and helpful, skills, talents, problem solving, earning a living. But below that is an undergirding quest. Listen to what he most wants us to learn, he says, that you may know the mysteries and peaceable things, that which bringeth joy, that which bringeth life eternal. Peaceable things, that which bringeth joy, the context of this is the temple. Temples are where all levels of joy combine, where togetherness with him and with others is hallowed and sealed into families. The temple is a magnifying glass of such learning and of such lasting love. There you see your mission in life in the framework of eternity. There mind and spirit and senses are reawakened to the grandeur of the world and of its joys. The temple is our most direct access to his mighty intelligence. And I trust to the line, he is more intelligent than they all. This is the glory of God. This is light and truth. In the house of the Lord, it is as if we are in the Panama Canal. The Spirit comes up, as it were, under us and lifts us. And when we leave, we leave on a different ocean. But at the same time we are there, the vessel itself is healed and repaired and recommissioned and floats away to the batterings and the confusions of daily life. The prophet said, speaking of these heavenly, peace-giving truths, I can taste the spirit of eternal life. You say honey is sweet, and so do I. When I tell you these things that are given me by the inspiration of the Holy Ghost, you are bound to receive them as sweet and rejoice more and more. In the original, he said, I rejoice more and more. Which did he mean? I, you. He meant both, because in that process we have been told, both are edified and rejoice together. The temple and those within it are a perpetual prayer for the fullness of the Holy Ghost. And that means ultimately the fullness of joy. But is there such a thing as the fullness of joy? Well, there is a portrait of how these dimensions came together once in this world. Near a temple in a land called Bountiful. Jesus, who had been rejected and crucified, and abandoned, now finds himself in the midst of a multitude of men, women, and children who have survived a three-hour earthquake. One of the most authentic notes, by the way, in the Book of Mormon, it says three hours, but then it has a comma. And some said it was longer. I've been in a 20-second earthquake, and I was already in serious trouble. All right. They not only listen, but they receive him for whom he is. Now, he could not do many mighty works at home, but now in his new home, he calls them together, and he heals the crippled and the wounded and perhaps those who had other kinds of affliction. All of them then fell to their knees and in prayer poured out gratitude. It says the Spirit taught them what they should pray. 
they had been commanded as we have to pray to the Father in the name of Christ. But now they prayed to him, calling him their Lord and their God. And then he almost apologetically says in his prayer, Father, they pray unto me because I am with them. Yes, in how many ways? With them. He had prayed that they would be one with him as he is with the Father. And now they were. Does the story end there? No, not yet. He calls for their little children. Textbooks say that children have some innate fears among them. The fear of falling, the fear of loud noises, the identification with the terror and screams of others. Well, do you think little children after a three-hour earthquake would not be clinging to their parents, bewildered, and shyly recoil from strangers? But he was no stranger. All of them were brought forward and were completely comfortable in his presence. And one by one, he scooped them up and blessed them as the parents, the grown-up children, beheld. And then he said, Behold, your little ones, and in his exquisite tenderness and the blessing of them. He then said, And now behold, my joy is full. The only place in Scripture that I know where he speaks of his own joy. Shortly after a sacramental feast, he turns from his own prayers to see them all men, women, children, kneeling and whitened and lightened and transformed. What they saw and felt, they say in the record, defies words, but they tried. They said, no one can conceive of the joy that filled our souls at the time we heard him Pray for us unto the Father. He bade them arise, but they did not because they were overcome. But he said to them when they finally stood, Blessed are ye because of your faith. And again, my joy is full. And when he had said these words, he wept. The power of that experience lasted in their children and their children's children for 200 years. And the resurrected Jesus Christ was the fulfillment in their presence of his own prophecy to us, spirit and element, inseparably connected, receive a fullness of joy. The joy of the Lord became their strength. Now, in closing, I had a convert, Quaker great-grandmother, whose name was Rachel. Joseph Smith taught her, and she had to reverse her notions from the past that there was little or no room for singing or dancing or playfulness or humor or for turning fasting into feasting. But on the theme of cultivating the inner light, she found in the fullness of the gospel confirmation of her earlier faith. Widowed eight days after the birth of her only son, she toiled her way through nagging poverty she forced the bishop to take her tithing when there were six pans on the floor 
catch it, the leaks from the roof. And brothers and sisters, in this day, a day of growth in the church, just count Chile and the Philippines and you have a million Latter-day Saints who are living pretty much with a tin roof and a dirt floor and on the wall, the 23rd Psalm. She served for 35 years as a Relief Society president, even while hurting, helping those who hurt more. During those years, she was completely deaf and therefore more sensitive to the light or its absence that she could see in the faces of those around her. She could not believe a promise made her by a patriarch that as Rachel of old she would have a worthy posterity. Only one son? Her own portraits and the fading photographs are a study of clear eyes and serenity, the face of a saint. Last night we attended the 100th family reunion of her posterity. She has 700 and they are all of them in the world and of the world of Jesus Christ. Brothers and sisters, this cannot be faked. No way it can be faked. All of the theater lights and the stages and the camera trickery and the Photoshop manipulation may convince us that artificial light has the same effect. It does not. It ends with the flipping of the switch. But it is a backhanded tribute to light by those who live unaware that Christ is the life and the light. The light that lightens hearts through thick and thin. So I sum this up with two quotations again from Brother Brigham. Quote, There is not a man or woman in the earth whose peace is made with God and who are associated with holy beings and seeking after holy principles, but their countenances are lit up with the lamp of divine cheerfulness. And again, elsewhere, I say, if you want to enjoy exquisitely, become a Latter-day Saint, and then live the doctrine of Jesus Christ. The man or woman who will do this will endure and enjoy most. And if they will be humble, and faithful, they will enjoy the glory and the excellency of the power of God and be prepared to live with God and with angels. We're approaching the season to be jolly, and may you be jolly, but it can be more. It can be the season to be joyful. Let us come and adore Him. Let us sing the songs of everlasting joy. In closing, my testimony, and I've been around a while, I've read and spent at least half of my life looking at alternative religions and outlooks, and I suppose also I am a bit of an expert on the alternative death styles that are out there. But I give you my testimony that one of the strongest arguments ever imposed upon me against this religion is that it is too good to be true. My testimony to you is it is both good and true and beautiful. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen.